Good evening friends. Today we'll look at the Hofas fracture, how we diagnose them and are there any cardinal principles of managing such cases. I'm your friend Webhav and in today's talk we'll look at the definition of Hofas fracture, what's the mechanism of injury, how do we diagnose various types of Hofas fracture. We'll also touch upon a new classification system for Hofas fracture and finally we'll talk about the management of various types of HOFAS. Now HOFAS fracture is an eponymous fracture described on the name of a German surgeon Albert Hofa who in 1904 in Würzburg, Kinnick Ludwig House described this fracture. Hofa was a very prolific writer and a surgeon and there are a lot of things credited to his name including the infrapatellar fat, fat disease also known as HOFAS disease and a physiotherapy or a massage system known as Hofa system of massage. He in, there's a very uh, interesting anecdote about his life where he worked at the railway station and in year 1892 he founded the journal Jesscraft for Osteopathic Chirurgy. So he was an interesting man and this is uh, this fracture is particularly described in his name. Now what are these fractures? These are the coronal fractures of the distal femur which are intra-articular and usually have only one attachment that is the posterior capsule. If you look at the AO classification, they typically fall in this 33B3 region describing the coronal fracture. The mechanism of injury is the shearing force on the posterior condyle. And it typically happens when the axial load is there on knee which is flexed beyond 90 degree resulting in a tangential force pattern. And depending on the degree of flexion, the pattern of fracture line varies. So more the degree of flexion, you will find that more the anterior fracture line exists. Whereas if the knee is more towards 90 degree, there is a smaller posterior component to this thing. These are typically a motorbike accident in young patients or when someone is trying to brake very hard when his leg is at the brake and sudden impact. These are the typical uh, reasons why Hofa fracture develop. They are the result of a uh, shear force in both sagittal and coronal pain and it is because of this reason that they are intrinsically unstable. A clinical exam will reveal an effusion and a very subtle varus or valgus instability may be present. Always remember to check for distal neurovascular deficit when you are dealing with such cases. If you look at the x-rays, on the AP there will be a foreshortened condyle and it may lead to appearance of varus or valgus malalignment of the knee. On true lateral, the femoral condyles will not appear to be superimposed. If there is a poor quality x-ray, there is a great chance that you might miss these fractures. Oblique view may add to your diagnostic arrangement, uh, but if you are in doubt, it is better to take a CT scan. If you look at this x-ray, it may appear innocuous, but if you look carefully, you will see that the, there is a malalignment of the condyles and that the condyles in a true lateral view are not at the same level. A CT scan certainly helps to delineate the fracture line and always look at all the planes of the CT scan, frontal, sagittal, coronal, axial, all the planes should be looked at to understand the anatomy. Now if you look at the management of the Hofa's fracture, we understand that the Hofa fracture effectively separates the patellofemoral joint from the tibiofemoral joint and whenever there is a knee movement, especially when someone is weight bearing, it will result in a high shear force along the fracture line and it is for this reason that the non-operative management is really unpredictable and stabilization with means other than a surgical intervention can be very challenging. If you look at the principle of treatment, we must ensure that it is atraumatic. As I said, often it is only the posterior capsule that is attached to the fragment, so it is very essential that the soft tissue attachments are maintained. This being an intra-articular fracture and an, an anatomical reduction is warranted. A secure fixation because they are subject to high shear forces is something which is very uh, crucial. 
and to avoid any arthrofibrosis and early mobilization and functional activity should be done. When we are planning for this, you should think about the approach, reduction, steps, fixation and how you are going to take care of it postoperatively. So positioning is on a standard translucent table. You can use this triangular uh, radiolucent uh, aid to help you take intraoperative x-rays. The approach will depend on the type of fracture and the commonest approaches are lateral parapetalar approach, medial parapetalar approach, a formal medial approach, a tibial tuberosity osteotomy approach and a posterior approach. Medial parapetalar approach is our standard approach for knee replacement and most of us are familiar with that. This is the lateral parapetalar approach and one should be wary of the common peroneal nerve and the way we extend the incision into the quadricep which is to be done in 4 by 10 or 6 by 10 pattern meaning 40% should be towards the incision and 60% should be left on the medial side. Similarly, a distance of 8 to 10 millimeter for an adequate closure is essential when we are doing a lateral parapetalar approach. A formal medial approach can also be done especially if the fragment is small on the medial side. Be wary of the neurovascular structure. The adductor hiatus is typically around 8 cm proximal to the adductor tubercle. So that's where your femoral vasculature turns and becomes the popliteal vasculature. And also there is a saphenous nerve which supplies the anteromedial aspect of the knee and one should be careful when dissecting in this area. Tibial tubercle osteotomy is a very extensile approach and sometimes needed to fix bicondylar Hofer's approach, uh, Hofer's fracture. Posterior approach is used when the fragment is too small to be fixed from the anterior side and done in prone position and we are all familiar with this approach for even some of the tibial condyle fractures. If you look at the steps of the surgery, the first step is adequate exposure to inspect the joint. You visualize the fracture line, clean it. If need, you can use a spreader on the opposite side. Anatomically reduce and hold it. Initiate drilling at the patellofemoral uh, joint and try to be the perpendicular to the fracture line. So that's here. We have had an adequate exposure. You clean, observe the fracture line, toggle it. After you have done that, you can clear the joint surface. You can use a small periosteal elevator to get your um, fracture in place. Apply a reduction clamp. You can use a joystick technique with a K wire. Once done, you insert guide wires perpendicular to the fracture line, just like this image, and then you fix it. Now, before we move to fixation, which is different for different types, there are some basic things. The in order for the fixation to be stable, at least two planes should be involved. That is why you need two screws or more or a plate. The implant should not violate the articular surface. And there are a variety of choice of implant ranging from 3.5 to 4.5 cortical compression, cannulated cancellers, headless, and of course, plates. Now, a very important thing is to understand at this stage is that the fixation is not the same for all Hofer's fracture. Your fixation will depend on the type of fracture in terms of the fracture line, the combination, the orientation and the size. And in order to simplify this, we give a small, uh, we propose a radiological classification based on the fracture configuration and we also gave a treatment strategy along with the review of literature. Those of you who are interested can go through this paper. So basically, there are four types of first fracture. The type 1 is the one in which the fracture line is around 2.5 cm away from the tip of the posterior condyle. Type 2 is when the fracture line is very close posteriorly and is less than 2.5 cm. Type 3 is when you have got combination and type 4 refers to special types in which the 4A is the anterior lip, B, B again, B for B which is the bicondylar Hofer's fracture, C is osteochondral or the very posterior fracture and D is some fractures which are associated with supracondylar fracture. So if you look at this image, you will see that type 1 is the one in which the fracture line is at least 2.5 cm away from the posterior most surface. Type 2 is when it is less. Type 3 is the combination. 4A is anterior Hofer's. 
four V is bicondylar, C is osteochondral, and D is uh, something with supracondylar extension. Again, in a in a different plane, you can see that there can be different type of hoofers fracture. So you have to understand that no hoofers is same, and thus your management strategy will change with the type of the fracture that you encounter. Let's see how, uh, with help of some X-rays and example, how we would fix it. This is the straightforward one type one. You'll see a large chunk of fragment, and this these are the one which are most amenable to a simple anterior to posterior screw, and that's how you would do it. You'll put the anterior to posterior screw perpendicular to the fracture line, and you are sorted. Type two is as I said, when the fracture line is is less than two point five centimeter away from the posterior surface, and these are the fracture in which you will need to do a posterior to anterior fixation, and the reason being that you will see a standard screw has got around 16 millimeter thread and if these thread engage the fracture line they will not achieve, achieve the compression and in fact distract it so the way to go is to go from posterior to anterior as has been done in this case you will see with this diagram that if the fracture screw threads are there at the fracture site the fracture site is opening and this CT scan clearly show what is happening when your fracture screws are at the uh, when when your screw uh, threads are at the fracture site, they are causing it to open. Type three are the one with combination, and these are the cases in which you should use uh, an additional fixation, more like a buttress plate, and that is how it will look. So these are some post-op X-rays. If you do not follow this principle, this is what happens. So if you have not, so if you look. Here, the, the, the fixation was not adequate, there was combination, and we ignored that, and this resulted into mal and non-union. Four is A is the anterior hoofers. Again, not very difficult type to heal. The only thing I would like to mention here is that you might want to use a headless screw here so as to avoid any impingement in the patellofemoral joint. Bicondylar hoofers, the thing to remember is that sometimes they need to be treated with a very extensile approach and sometimes along with tibial tubercle osteotomy so just like a revision knee arthroplasty you might need to do this to get an adequate exposure posteriorly and then the fixation would be pretty much in lines of what we saw for uh, type 1 and uh, type 3 fractures type 4 C is the osteochondral fracture which is often missed and you'll see here that there's a very thin sliver of the um, uh, the the bone here which is there and often missed so the best way is to see it in the MRI or a CT scan so MRI is much more sensitive and you'll see that these are the ones in which you can use this anti-glide plate here so the the first one here is showing a diagrammatic representation of a, how an anti-glide plate would look like Type 4D are hardcore orthopedic problems in which you will find that along with uh, hofas you have got a supracondylar extension and in this case you will see that how on the 2D planes and the 3D planes you can see that there is a uh, hofas fracture here along with the supracondylar extension here and here and this is the point. And these are the patients in which you will need to put a, 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 a large rigid implant here along with something here and again follow the principle of headless screws this is quite a challenging thing you'll have to fit the jigsaw puzzle with all your ingenuities one must be aware of the complications which could be loss of reduction malunion non-union neurovascular damages and as i said if you have not handled soft tissues properly you may cause an avn we must also know on the horizon are arthroscopically assisted surgeries 3D printing and use of bioabsorbable implants. So the take home message is that it is important to diagnose these fractures and maintain a high index suspicion. The management is almost always an operative management. It is important to customize the treatment, so treat according to type of fracture and the most important thing is to respect the soft tissue. This is a chart, a simple chart on how to approach a different type of HOFAS fracture starting from type 1 where the anterior to posterior screw is put, type 2 posterior to anterior screw, type 3 is buttress plate, type 4A is again anterior to posterior screw, 4B 
will be depending on the size of the fragment. C is headless screw or bioabsorbable pins and 4D is a rigid locking plate along with the lag screws. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I welcome any questions that you may have on this subject. Hofas fracture are, um, uh, are something which test your metal as a trauma surgeon and I'm sure most of you once familiar with the technique would enjoy doing this fracture. It is important to operate them early and also ensure that the patient gets a full range of motion at earliest. Uh, on the face of it, they may look difficult, but if done well, they are very satisfying surgeries. Thank you very much.